If we wouldn't mind um, turning this morning to Numbers, Numbers chapter 13. And I'm going to read um, a few verses from verse 26 through down to verse 33. So Numbers 13, verse 26, and we shall read down to verse 33. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Amen. Amen. Father, I just want to give you the glory this morning, and as always, Father, to ask now for your strength, to ask, Lord, for the anointing of the Spirit of God to rest upon thee now, Lord, to do what I cannot do in the natural, and what can only be done, Father, in the supernatural, by the working of your grace, which is mighty, Father, Lord, would you glorify your son now? Would you bring him honor in our midst? Would you lift up our hearts and give courage to our souls, Father, that we might be able to stand in this perilous hour, not as those knocking our knees, Father, and looking back behind us, but as those, Father, rallying under that blood-stained cross, singing the praises of Zion and marching forward into, into glory and into victory, with the cross of Christ going before us. Oh, Father, we would ask this now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The title of this morning's sermon is Let Us Go Up At Once. Let Us Go Up At Once. Again, we find ourselves this morning staring the divine attributes of God in the face. It may seem on the surface not to be so, but I want to encourage you and rest assured this morning that it most assuredly is. I hear one say, what has the narrative that we have just read got to do with the attributes of God? And by attributes, I mean those characteristics. I mean those qualities which define God's person and nature, his character. I hear one say this morning, what has number 13 got to do with the attributes of God? And I simply respond by saying, everything, everything. Now I grant you that none of the attributes of God are explicitly stated in the passage of scripture that we have just read. It's not like Micah chapter 3 and verse 6 as we heard last week. For I am the Lord, I change not. It's not like Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. 
I am Alpha and Omega, declares the Lord, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I understand that the Numbers passage is not quite like that, in that it explicitly, and by explicit I mean it states clearly the attributes of God, but nonetheless they are most certainly implicitly suggested, as we shall see shortly. I have two divine attributes in mind this morning. Last week, you remember, we spoke of the mercy of God and the judgment of God. We spoke of his great compassion and his terrifying wrath. Well, this week, I have two more attributes of God in mind to bring before your hearing that I want to bring out, not from my mind, but from the text of Scripture that we have just read. Which two divine attributes do I have in mind this morning? Well, didn't you see them in the text? The omnipotence of God and the faithfulness of God. These two divine attributes I submit lie buried here in the text. And with eyes to see, they become so abundantly clear. The omnipotence of God and the faithfulness of God. And even as these two attributes, the words roll off my tongue, I'm moved within me with joy at the hearing of these words because I know in what truly they convey as I say them. I want to say this morning... As I said last week, that God does not change. One of his attributes is his immutability. I am the Lord, I change not. The same God of then is the same God of now. The same God of history is the same God of the present. And that's why I'm excited this morning when I speak about the omnipotence of God. And by that, I mean the almighty power, the supreme power of almighty God. My heart rejoices because the God that I read in Numbers is the same God that I serve and that you serve. His faithfulness is the same then as it is today. God hasn't changed. In other words, I get to experience and you get to experience the God of the Bible today. In 2022, we get to walk with him to prove him. We get to love him, we get to marvel at his wondrous ways as he makes himself known in our lives. How many know that the God in the Bible is not distant and far, but is nigh unto them that call upon him? And we're not religious this morning in the sense that we follow God afar, but we have an experience and daily we encounter this divine being in every sphere and area of life. Friends, it is good to walk with the Lord. Imagine a God with limited power for a moment. Imagine a God like those deities that the pagans serve, all the while they're involved in some cosmic battle, sometimes losing, sometimes winning. Now, the God of the Bible, on the other hand, demands that the one who calls him God the one who himself is God, must have absolute and total power. That's what we mean when we speak of omnipotence, possessing absolute and total power. That is, as there's nothing that would hinder God's hand from moving if he so decides to move. It's not like you and I where we might come to a problem and hit a junction in the road and we're not able, we do not possess the strength to move forward, not God. He's limitless in his power and has abundant strength, abundant might. God says here in Isaiah and 45, or sorry, Isaiah chapter 46, Isaiah 46 and 5 and 7, he says this, To whom will you liken me and make me equal? He's challenging Israel because, you see, Israel had a tendency to go after idols. And God was saying that 
Israel, whom will you liken me to? Who will you make my equal and compare me that we may be like? Who's God's um, comparison, if you like? Who's his contemporary? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh it a god and they fall down, yea, they worship. They carry this god, this idol on their shoulders. They carry him and set him in his place and he stands. From his place he shall not be removed. Yea, one shall cry to him, and yet he cannot answer, nor save him out of his troubles. Not the God of the Bible, the false gods of the pagans, the idols, mute and deaf, that need to be carried away around and put in a place, and when they're put there, they cannot arise again to move. I mean, can you think of the folly of it? How can such a piece of wood or stone ever deliver a soul? God is saying, I'm not like that, but our God is in the heavens. Our God is in the heavens. Psalm 115 and verse 3. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they see not. Ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet, they have, but they walk not. Neither speak through their throat. Verse 7, verse 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. This is our God, omnipotent, possessing all power. Our Lord God, Jeremiah said, Behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. By thy great power. What does that look like? Let there be light and there was light. That's the power of our God and the light and the darkness he divided. The light he called day, the darkness he calls night. Our God but speaks the universe into existence. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Friends, take that to heart this morning. God declares it. There is nothing too hard for thee. Amen and amen. This is the God that we serve, Jeremiah 32 and verse 17. And finally, in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? Who is able to counsel out the plans of God? He's determined to do something. He shall do it. The Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it Back, Isaiah 14 and verse 27, and it's a rhetorical question. The answer's no one. You and I can set out with plans as grand as they might be, and we find that we're on the way somewhere and our car breaks down, and we now need to be dependent upon another to help us, not God. He sets out to do something, and it will be done. No man shall stay his hand. No man shall turn him back from all that he has purposed. That's omnipotence. That's possessing all power and all might. And I find we're in a world today that many like to call themselves gods, but this is God properly defined. This is God possessing all power. And one look in the mirror would tell us for sure that how can we be that? You know, frail and weak humanity, but not so with God. Now, I could go on and on furnishing such prized texts, but I want to ask you this morning this. 
Not whether we've heard them audibly, but whether or not we actually allow the text of Scripture to impact our lives. How do these verses that you and I have just read impact us in our living? In our living. You see, studying the divine attributes of God for some has been a dry, dusty task. You know, it's a task reserved for the theologians, all these grand words, omniscience and omnipotence and immutability. You know, these difficult words and scholars give themselves to studying these words. But friends, if they do not impact our living, then it's vanity. It's vanity. I can hear all day long what God's like, but how does it impact my life? How does it cause my relationship with him to be affected? We're not called to study God for study's sake. God reveals himself in order that we might know him so as to draw near to him in full assurance of faith. If he does not possess absolute power, then what confidence could you or I ever have in drawing near to him? I mean, think about it for a minute. How could we come to God, as the scripture says, to obtain help and find grace in time of need if when we get before him, he somehow says to us, well, this problem's too big. I can't deal with this one. It's off my radar. I don't possess the strength. Well, then we would have no confidence by which to draw near to God. If he's not omnipotent, possessing all power, then maybe he can't help us. Maybe our little situation is too big for God to deal with. Is that the God that we serve? I don't think so. Nothing is too difficult for thee. That's the declaration of scripture. And the challenge for us is therefore work that out in your life. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious and worrying and careful for nothing. If this is our God and he's truly omnipotent, then we can come to him. We can make our requests known to him. And God is able to take the matter at hand and deal with whatever it may be. But equally this morning, I want to tell you that not only of God's omnipotence, but I want to say that if God is not faithful, faithfulness of God... If God is not faithful, then by the same token, what confidence could we have to draw near to him? How can he be trusted if he's not faithful? Maybe he'll change his mind. And what he promised last month, today is no longer on the table. Is that the God that we serve? You see, we can take some of these things for granted, but friends, we must never take the attributes of God for granted. He's faithful, which means if God has said it, then God will do it. He doesn't change his mind. It's not like today is feeling like this and tomorrow, well, that was yesterday. It's too late, you know, and he changes his plans. No, God is faithful. He's faithful. And the scripture declares him to be so. Psalm 36 and verse 5. I'm just going to quote a few scriptures before we turn to some text. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. That's how far his mercy is extended in the heavens. And thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. How far does God's faithfulness reach? Unto the clouds. How far is that far? God's faithfulness. God's making these qualities known to man, not because God needs reminding. He doesn't have a complex problem. He doesn't lack, as it were, self-confidence and worth. He knows who he is. He's letting us know so that we can know. And then when we know, we can be convinced and we can draw near to God. In Psalm 40 and verse 10, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart, Psalm 14, verse 10. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness 
and thy truth, that is your trustworthiness, from the great congregation. The psalmist says, I've made these things known. I've not hid them within my heart and kept them to myself. I wanted all of Israel to know that this Lord is who you are. I've told of your faithfulness. I've spoken of your deliverance, of your salvation. I've not concealed your loving kindness in my heart. I've revealed it to the congregation. Your trustworthiness, I've told them. Psalm 89 and verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Not only the omnipotence of God, but also the faithfulness of God. Do these words mean anything to you? How do they impact your walk with the Lord. So many Christians live shallow walks with God because they don't really know God. They don't know God because if they knew God, then they would not walk so often as they do. The faithfulness of God. In the Hebrew, this literally means firmness. Firmness. It speaks of steadfastness. What does steadfastness mean? That which is firmly fixed in place, immovable. That means that the promises of God are not subject to change. They are yea and amen in Christ. Why? Because faithful is the one who promised. He's like that mighty rock sticking out of the sea that's foundations go right down deep beneath. You try and move that rock, you send the ship into it, the ship will suffer loss, the rock will come off scot-free. This kind of steadfast faithfulness is the God that we serve. He's firm, his promises are sure, he's immovable. I want you to hear this morning the exhortation of Scripture and the ground upon which this exhortation rests. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. The writer of Hebrews exhorts us as believers, listen to this, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Hebrews 10 verse 23. We're exhorted to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, without oscillating up and down, serving God today, turning our back on him tomorrow, walking with God today, serving him from afar off next week. This isn't the type of Christianity that we're supposed to have, but yet for many this is acceptable. Serving God the first six months of the year, backslidden the second half. Come New Year again, the New Year's resolutions kick in. Serving God again for half the year. Then the troubles and the trials come and they fade away. And the latter part of the year, they're nowhere to be seen. Is this how we're to walk as Christians? No. Let us hold fast. There should be some consistency to our walk. There should be some steadfastness to our service in the Lord. We shouldn't be like the sea, the waves of the sea, up and down and up and down. We're to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. That's why. Because the God that we serve is faithful. Now what does that mean? That means that when we hit problems... We don't turn away from God and say, well, Lord, thank you. We'll handle this one ourselves. Because by doing that, we're going to find ourselves in a lot of mess. When we hit problems, we call on the Lord. No one said the Christian life would be easy. It's full of perils. But God is with us in the perils. We bring God with us in every aspect and avenue of life, knowing and being fully persuaded that God is faithful, who has promised. He'll not desert us at last. He's with us in the race. Mere theology? I think not. This has to impact 
our lives, it has to, so as to move and arouse us to action. God is not a man that he should lie, Numbers 23 and verse 19. Neither the Son of Man that he should repent, that he should change his mind. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Rhetorical question. Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make good? Of course he will. If God has said something, he'll make good on his promise. His word is bond. His word is sure. His word is steadfast. Lord, that's all I needed to hear. That settles the matter. Lord, you'll do it. Our friends, we're not to have this merely as ideas floating around in our minds. This is to work itself out into our life. We get to experience this God. That's the beauty. We don't call men to church, we call them to Christ. Come and follow him. And experience what we experience, a life with the Lord, serving him all the days of our life. We get to experience this faithful God, this omnipotent God in our experience. Now with the ground laid this morning, I want to turn back to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. This morning, and if you remember upon beginning this sermon, I said these words, that we're here again this morning, staring the divine attributes of God in the face. And it may seem on the surface not to be the case, but rest assured it most certainly is. I'm wondering if you might be able to spot the two attributes that I have in mind. Perhaps verse 30 might somehow allow you to come to understand and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Staring you in the face, but implicit within the text, granted. On what basis, please, can I ask you the question, did Caleb say these words, let us, Israel, go up at once and possess it. Possess what? The land. For we are well able to overcome it. Was it not on the grounds of the two attributes that we have mentioned this morning, namely this, God's omnipotence and God's faithfulness? I submit that it was on these two grounds that Caleb was fully persuaded of why he could say the words he said in verse 30. As the people were shaking and fretting as evil report came up from the town that the land that God has called us to possess, we be not able to possess it. Why? The people are too strong. The giants are in the land and we're like grasshoppers in their sight. But hang on a moment, who told you to go up and possess the land? Well, Caleb told the people God said. Well, then if God said, is he not able to do it? If God said it, is he not faithful to perform it? Caleb had settled these matters and was fully persuaded in his heart and said, giants or not, we're going into the land because God said it. And I don't care how many giants there might be, God will slay everyone down. Caleb knew the Lord, and thus he could still the people and say, let us go up at once, without delay. I love that. It was like when David ran to Goliath, he didn't walk toward that giant trembling, and on his tiptoes, we're told in the old King James, I think he hasted. He hastened towards him, he ran at him. Couldn't wait, let's bring it on. Why? Because David was strong? No, because God was strong 
And David knew the God that he served. And he said, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like that lion and bear that God slew and threw me when they tried to take the lamb out. Or, or when they tried to take the lamb from among the flock. I want to translate Caleb's words for you this morning in my little paraphrase translation. It says here that Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And I paraphrase the text as follows. Let us go up at once and possess the land. For God is faithful to give it us. Who promised our father Abraham? Mind not the giants now, and look not upon their stature. Let's go in at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome. Because if God be on our side, who can be against us? You see, you have to look a little deeper here to see implicitly within the text these glorious attributes of God, his omnipotence and his faithfulness. Oh, friends, would we allow that to sink in? God knew what he was doing. We're going to look at the text shortly. God was the one who allowed them to go in. Indeed, he was the one who sent the spies into the land. God knew what was in the land. It wasn't because God needed to know. God was trying the people and see if they would still believe him in the face of adversity. And friends, God is going to lead you and I into all types of adversity because he wants to prove us to see what's in our heart. And when the sun is shining and the sea is calm, anyone can say they're a Christian and serve God. But you see, you don't really get to prove our God in that type of climate. You get to prove our God when he sends you up Everest or when he calls you into the Antarctic where the winds are blustering and the trials abound. It's there where we get to prove the omnipotence of God and the faithfulness of God as we put our confidence and trust in him. I understand it isn't easy to serve the Lord because we have to die daily. We have to die to our thoughts and our rationale and our reasoning. And we have to say, when anything, everything's said and done, Lord, I'm just going to choose to believe this book and what it says about you. And when we do that, we prove God over and over and over and over again, and we get something called a testimony. Friends, have you a testimony? Not a testimony of 10 years ago when you first met the Lord. I mean a current testimony, a present testimony of God's deliverance, of his power, of his faithfulness at work in your life. If you look here in chapter 14 and verse 8, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 8, I just want to read you two verses, verse 8 and also verse 40. Joshua and Caleb speaking here. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. I love that. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land. It doesn't matter what it might appear like. God will do it. He'll give it us. This land which flows with milk and honey. In verse 40 of chapter 14. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. You see, after God had dealt with the people and, and judged them by saying that they were going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until that unbelieving generation died out and their children would be the ones to go up and inherit the land, only Joshua and Caleb were allowed to go up because they had another spirit within them. The people decided to change their mind and said, no, look, we, we want to go up now. 
And Moses says, don't do it. But I want you to pay attention to this word promised, promised, because you see, it wasn't um, Moses' idea for the people to inherit the land. It wasn't Joshua and Caleb's idea. It was God's idea. God had promised to do it. The Lord has promised. We will go up unto the place which the Lord has promised. So they understood that God had promised it, but they chose not to believe him. Important. If we look at chapter 13, please, I'm going to read from verses 17 down to verse 20. Numbers 13, verse 17, down to verse 20. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Remember, there was to be 12 rulers of the people, one from each of the 12 tribes. And God had said to them that he wanted, through Moses, send them into the land to spy out the land. Now, as I've said already, God was fully aware of what was in the land. It wasn't because God didn't know. He knew there was giants there. He knew the people were still in the land and were strong and mighty. But you see, if the people would have believed God, what happened at Jericho could have happened 40 years before. I don't seem to remember a sword being lifted. They marched around the city walls. And on the seventh time, if my memory serves me correctly, they lifted up their voice and shouted and blew the trumpets and the walls came down. I mean, I haven't seen many victories won like that, but God was with them. The omnipotent God, the faithful God who said it. It wasn't going to be by Israel's strength. And friends, as you serve the Lord, it's not going to be by your strength. It's going to be by God's strength. And if you'll trust him, he'll make his power known to you and you'll see his glory and you'll give him thanks. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land. I want you to see it, what it is. And the people that dwell therein, listen to this, whether they be strong or weak, God knew they were strong, Few or many, God knew there were many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, it was good land. And what the cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, they dwelt in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it is fat or lean, it was fat or in abundance. Whether there be wood therein or not, there was plenty of wood. And be ye of good courage, God says to them. Regardless of what you see with your eyes, here, O Israel, I want you to be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time, now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. What was God doing? He was testing his people in the same way as he often tests us. God knew the situation, but his encouragement to the people, he knew this on one hand, it was exactly as God had said, bountiful provision. But there was a slight problem. The people were many, they dwelt in strongholds, they were giants, and uprooting them would seem humanly impossible. But how many know with God, nothing is impossible. His encouragement to the people through the mouth of Moses was this. Be ye of good courage. Number one, God said to them and God says to us that if you're going to go in to possess the land, you're going to need to be strong. Christianity isn't for weaklings. It isn't for... Nancy Pamsis, as it were, strong men, courageous men, courage and bravery and valor mark the Christian. In the words of C.T. Studd, is no chocolate soldier. 
You're going to need to be strong, be of good courage, brave in the face of danger. You're going to see things in the land, Israel, which after the natural looking would cause you to fear and will cause you to fear. But I want you to be strong. I don't want you to look at the outward and to tremble. I want you to trust me. Why? Because I'm with you. Be courageous. Be of good courage. I'm with you. God was testing their faith. What else? Number two. God asked them to bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. Now it was no coincidence that God sent the people into the land at this particular time. We're told at the end of verse 20 that it was the time of the first ripe grapes. What did that mean? The harvest was plenteous. And when the children of Israel go into the land, God timed it perfectly so what they see would be exactly as he had said. Fruit in abundance. Grapes like you've never seen before, where it took two men to have to carry the cluster on a stick. I mean, we don't get grapes like that from the supermarkets. This was fruit in abundance. The land indeed was, as God said, flowing with milk and honey. And there was a reason for this, as we shall see in a moment. So they went up in verse 21. They went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men come to Hamath. They ascended by the sail south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eskol and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs, the place was called the Brook of Eskol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. It's just like you said. Surely it floweth with milk and honey. And look at these whopping grapes. This is the fruit of it. It's exactly as the Lord had said. And if only they would have stopped there, they would have gone in to possess the land. But you see, God arranged the circumstances. And I want you to see the common link here the relationship to this text and the relationship to God's working in your life. So often God gives us glimpses of the promise that he has said he would give. But he allows us also to see the many difficulties. Why? God knew the difficulties were there when he promised. It's not that suddenly these difficulties came and God said, oh, I didn't foresee this, and now I'm not able to do what I said. He's able to do what he said because he has all power, and those difficulties pose no problem whatsoever to him. He's willing to do it because he's faithful, and he said it, and so what he said, he will do. Two simple concepts but so many lack to understand these in their lives and oscillate all over the place. This minute a problem presents itself to them. Come on, friends. God would have us know who he is, that we might trust him. If they'd stopped there, all would have been well. But as I said, God had arranged the circumstances such 
that the blessings were shrouded in many perils, shrouded with many difficulties. In other words, to inherit the promised blessings, Israel were going to have to trust him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And tell me, if there were no difficulties in the way, where would be the faith? Where would be the need to trust him? We trust God because, humanly speaking, it seems impossible. But God, I believe with you, all things are possible. That's faith. That's faith. In other words, to inherit the promised blessing, they were going to have to trust God. Faith was involved. Does it sound familiar? Oh, any time God works in my life in a wonderful way, it always, always involves faith. The blessings there, shrouded in many difficulties and trials. This unfolding scenario presents a fork in the road to Israel, and I want you to hear this, please. It presents a fork in the road. They have two options. They can look on this with eyes of faith, or they can look on this with eyes of unbelief. And when problem arises in our lives, we always have these two options, to trust God or not, to put the lens of faith on, or to allow the lens of unbelief to dominate and distort our perception. Listen to me now on this, please. On one hand, seeing through the eyes of faith, what an amazing opportunity. We get to see the Lord's mighty arm at work. We get to prove his omnipotence. We get to prove his faithfulness. What an opportunity the Lord has given us. Come on, guys, let's go in and take them out and get our fruit and dwell in the land of blessing and promise. That's Israel with the eyes of faith. I seem to remember there was only two who had those lenses on out of a nation of millions, a couple of million people. Well, if we take the adults, perhaps a million or so. Joshua and Caleb, two people, put those lenses on. Or we can look at the situation through the lens of unbelief and immediately seeing the situation, we say to God, why, Lord, is this some sick joke? You dangle the carrot before us and then you put a forest of nettles in the way so that we cannot get through to possess the blessing. Lord, are you playing games with us? Is this a joke? Same environment, but different outlooks, different outlooks. Yeah, God puts the prized treasure surrounded by nettles, but not because he doesn't intend to give it them. He wants to know what's in their heart. How are they going to respond? And friends, God will arrange circumstances such in your life that whenever there is blessing, it will be shrouded in trial and peril and difficulty because God is saying, will you trust me in spite of off and when we do we get to experience God and the reason why so many do not experience God and why they're always going back at the slightest sniff of danger is because they do not know God and if they do know God they will not trust him they allow unbelief to dominate their lives from year to year to year and friends we cannot go on in this way God wants us to start trusting him he wants us to start believing. It has all the perfect hallmarks of God's doing. I remember the testimony of this church, and I know I go on about this, but it's so precious. The day God called us to look, and we looked through the gate. I mean, nettles, forests, junk everywhere, pigeons flying around. To the natural mind, we're like, is this a joke? Is this, is this some sick idea, Lord? But through the lens of faith, we were able to see things not as they are, but to see the blessing that God had given him. And the problems merely present God the opportunity to show his mighty power. That we get to prove him now in 2021 that he's a faithful God. And so faith arised in our hearts and there were times where we just had to get alone with God. This poor man is subject to unbelief like the rest of them. How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? We haven't the funds. We haven't the manpower. Thought after thought. 
Bring it to the cross. Bring it to the cross. Bring it to the cross. Pray and lay hold on God and you'd not be immediate in prayer before faith arises in your heart. Lord, I know the problems are there, but you've said it, Lord, and I'm not going to doubt your power. You said it, Lord, and I'm not going to doubt your faithfulness. And so this is how this project was went. We prayed as a church. We called on the name of God and God brought the blessing into place. Have we other issues? Of course, we have a room upstairs prepared. God shows us the fruit of the land. This is what I want to do. This is what, but Lord, there's no Sunday school teachers. And Lord, where are they going to come from? And will you trust me, God says? Just trust me. Have I not done all of this? Is it anything too difficult for me that I cannot? He already has the person in the making. Will we not wait on him in faith for God to show him? Don't grow weary. The God that we serve is omnipotent. It's best have him build it than we try and build it and make a mess of it. God is able to build his church. If the Lord does not build, then what? The laborers labor in vain. If the Lord does not keep the city, the watchers watch in vain. And when God's done that, which he will, and I can go on record today to say he will, not because I'm a prophet, but because God said it, and friends, you look back in your life, everything that God has said, tell me, has it not come to pass? And those things that you are yet waiting upon, God assures your heart it's going to happen. Be of good cheer, I've said it. Now, if God hasn't said it, it's presumption, and we're second-guessing, but I'm on about when God makes his will clear. You and I are to trust him. He said it, he will do it. And I thank God. I know it's painful. I know I'd rather him just give it me and it's all done. And Lord, can you not be so painful? But this is the Christian life. It's painful. Our flesh just leaps around like, you know, a, a frog in a frying pan. Get me out of here, Lord. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel nice. I haven't got control. Lord, I don't know what's coming down. God says, just trust me. I know it's uncomfortable. But just settle the nerves and just trust me. It will be okay. I'm with you. This is the Lord's doing, friends. If only it would have stopped with the good report, but the people proceeded to go on and to tell the people of all the badness and the dangers and the peril that lay ahead. In verse 28, we'll be coming to a close shortly. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Where's the nevertheless with God? There's no nevertheless with God. He should have stopped in verse 27, ended it, that's enough. There's no nevertheless with God, friends. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And I can almost see the knees of the people beginning to knock together as these ten elders spew out their unbelief all over the people. Friends, you better be careful what you say when God's at work, that we don't spew our unbelief over other people and infect them. That's what they did. They spewed their unbelief all over the people. They didn't need any encouragement. They were already full of unbelief. Caleb tried to encourage them. But here the ten come saying, forget it, friends. It's, it's a disaster. It's not going to happen. They murmured against the leaders. They murmured against the Lord. And I would to God for men and women to rise up in this day with another spirit like Caleb had. We're told here in verse 30, Caleb stilled the people. It's amazing what effects a little murmuring can sow into a congregation. I thank God for Caleb. God said of this man, Caleb, in Numbers 14 and verse 24, listen to this. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit. He wasn't like the vast multitudes. He had another spirit within him and has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereinto he went and his seed 
shall possess it. I want you to hear again the words of Caleb. Now it's from another paraphrase of mine, the amplified paraphrase of this verse here in verse 30. Caleb, still the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Filled with faith and courage, though the people murmured, Caleb said to the congregation who stood trembling in fear and unbelief, Enough! Let us go up at once and possess the land. For God is faithful to give it us, who promised our father Abraham. Look at the size of these pomegranates and figs. Look at these giant grapes. It's surely a land flowing in milk and honey, just as God said. Mind not the giants now. Look not upon their stature. Be of good courage and look to the Lord. Let us go up at once and possess the land, for we are well able to overcome it. Because if God be on our side, who can be against us? The attributes of God implicit within the text and I would to God for him to raise up men and women in this hour. You, we like to read the history books of how God has done great things in the past, the William and Catherine Booths, the John Wesleys and the Charles Wesleys. Friends, these weren't flakes. These were men and women of courage. These were men and women who said goodbye to the world and they purposed with their hearts that they're going to spend the rest of their life serving the Lord. These were men of another spirit. God said to the booths, go in and take the land where taverns abounded and men got drunk out their minds. We haven't a chance in this city. William Booth said nothing of the sort. Rally the men together. The gospel shall triumph and Christ shall give us the victory. And they went into those towns and pubs and taverns were closed down. And the people pelted them with tomatoes and stones, but they went on to the next town. Churches were planted through courageous men and women. Friends, we have a choice to make this morning. Either we whimper, we distrust God and we charge him a liar, or else we believe him. We believe him. And we say, as Caleb said, let us go up at once, without delay and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Who will rally the troops together in this hour under the blood-stained banner of Calvary and say what God has done in time past is able to do the same today? There's a time to wait upon God, our men and our men. But this was not that time. The command had been given, go up. And so they went. As Caleb said, sorry, go up. Now I want in closing just to come back to the response of the other ten because as I've said, Joshua and Caleb were in the minority. We're closing now. You may just read from verses, chapter 13, verses 26 um, down as we read. Well, really particularly from um, verse 28 and 29. You might read these two verses and say, well, look, it's just a bit of murmuring. What's the big deal? They merely pointed out that the people are strong. The cities are walled and very great. They just pointed out there's giants in the land. The Jebusites, the Amalekites, and so on populated. On the surface, it doesn't seem like any big deal. But you see beneath the surface, remember this fork in the road? God allows us to see what's behind the surface of their murmuring. Raw, stenching unbelief. That's what lay beneath their murmuring. It progressively revealed itself to be so. Look here now in verse 31. They're outraged that Caleb would dare to suggest rubbish men go in and possess it. Look what happens. The men that were with him said, Ah, their true colors are now coming out. We be not able to go up against the people, why ever not? They're stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land. Watch it, friends, when murmuring of unbelief takes hold. It has 
incredible, it can cause incredible damage. They brought up an evil report of the land which they'd searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight." What appeared to only be murmurs and, or tremors of murmuring in verse 28 and 29 is now revealed for what it was, unbelief. The bottom line was this, Lord, we just don't think you can do it. That's the bottom line. And so murmuring takes hold of them and that murmuring manifests itself before the congregation in rank unbelief. God is not able to do it. But don't stop there as we finish the last four verses. I want you to see where this leads. The elders infect the congregation. It's incredibly important that a leader does not exhibit unbelief amongst the people. Because they're called to have character. Think of a captain in the war as the enemy approaches and they start trembling and say, men, men, come on, and they retreat. What do you think is going to happen? The whole army is going to lose faith. The greatest captains have been those that have stood when the armies are advancing and they know they're outnumbered. They know technically they're not going to win, but they hold the fort. You see, the captains of old and the generals of old weren't in some office somewhere, punching numbers into a machine. They were leading the men forward into battle, as King David did. And that commander would turn to the armies and say, play the man, be of good courage. David would say, God is with us. But these leaders allowed their unbelief to manifest itself before the people. And before you know it, the whole congregation, unbelief runs through them like the plague. The congregation lift up their voice, all of them now, and they begin to cry and they begin to weep tears. And they begin to murmur against God's leaders now, Moses and against Aaron. The leaders always get it in the neck. You know, why have you brought us this way, Moses and Aaron? They were just doing what God told them to do, but the people didn't like it. And the whole congregation said to them, would God that we'd have died in the land of Egypt? Would God we had died in this wilderness? Why has the Lord brought us up into this land to fall by the sword? Now they're charging God with evil. It's gone from murmuring to rank unbelief. Now they're charging God with evil, that the Lord has purposely done this to take them out. See where unbelief will take you, friends. It will charge the goodness of God with evil. It will cause you to say the faithfulness of God is wickedness. This is what unbelief does. Okay, let us close. Wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? It was better not for us, was it not, to return? Or sorry, were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Their attack moves swiftly from God's leaders to God himself. God, why did you bring us into this land to kill our, us and our families? What kind of loving God are you? You say... Yeah, what kind of, un, what kind of loving God are you? You say what you have no power to do. You promise what you have no intention to give. We're going back to Egypt. And I want to warn you this morning as I finish now. There are many of God's people, perhaps some even within this sanctuary this morning, who can run awfully close to saying the same things. You might not put it so crudely as Israel did. I understand that. But veiled in your murmurings and your complaints to God is this spirit of unbelief that really, God, you don't mean us well. 
Really, Lord, you say you're loving, but I'm not feeling that love. And you know what, God? I just don't think you're a loving God. Lord, your word says you're faithful, but you're not doing it, Lord. And so I don't think you're faithful. I don't think you're loving. I don't think you're really powerful enough to make the difference in my life. Why don't we just come out and say it as it is? We veil it behind all these Christian terminology, but that's the root of the matter. And God says this is evil. I'm a good God. I'm a loving God. I'm a faithful God. The problem is you, Israel, you'll not believe me, so you'll never get to see it. Oh, friends, God is calling us this morning to rise up, to rise up, and to trust him. God is leading his people. He's leading this church. He's leading you in your life. He wants you to walk with him. And yes, he'll bring you to the edge of the Red Sea with the Egyptians hot on your tail. But he's not brought you there to cast you into the sea. He's going to part the sea and bring you through. I just want to finish. It's just come to my mind. Exodus 14, just one verse. One verse. We, we read this in a prayer meeting on Wednesday. I was on a prayer meeting with some pastors. I want you to hear this. It's amazing. It's so wonderful. Verse 15. You see the people are shaking at the edge of the Red Sea. Fear has laid hold on them. They see the Egyptians advancing in. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace in verse 14. And I want you to hear this in verse 15 as Moses is interceding and talking to God about it. The Lord said to Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Enough, Moses. Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. Oh, friends, that's so encouraging. Moses, stop whinging. Tell the people of Israel to silence. We're going forward. March. The Lord is with us. Let us go up at once. Hold your peace, dear friends. God is on your side. We get to experience him. And I trust that we will not be of this spirit of unbelief, but we would be willing to trust God in the day of his power. Amen. Amen. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, um, for the truth of your word this morning. Thank you for the text of Scripture. Thank you for the challenge that again has been issued to us, Father. Lord, we're tired of reading about you in the history books. We want to experience you for ourselves. We recognize fully, Lord, that it will be replete with trials and danger and difficulty, Lord. But, Father, have you not orchestrated these things and arranged the table such that you might prove us to see what is in our hearts, whether we would trust you or not. And I pray, Lord God, that we would not look, Lord, upon the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the Annex, Lord, and all the giants in the land. But, Father, with our eyes fixed on the prize, we would say, Lord, if thou be with us, who can be against us? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.